This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome Charles Goodhart and his colleague Manoj Pradham, and we are going to be talking about Goodhart's Law and the new book, The Great Demographic Reversal, Aging Societies, Waning Inequality, and an Inflation Revival. Charles Goodhart is member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee and former professor at the London School of Economics, developer of Goodhart's Law. You can look that up in Wikipedia, but of course, we'll talk about it today. And he is the son of Arthur Lehman Goodhart, who was the first American to be the master of an Oxford college and the brother of House of Lords member William Goodhart and leading British conservative politician Sir Philip Goodhart. Quite a pedigree. And his new book, we'll talk about that today. So I'm really looking forward to this. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. First, I'd like to start off uh, with Manoj, maybe. And can you explain your research and how you became affiliated with uh, Charles? So Charles and I worked on this idea when we were both at Morgan Stanley uh, in the economics team. And that's where we talked about what demographics would do, how debt might or might not stand in the way. And that was something that was taken on in a presentation to the BIS at the annual seminar, which then developed into a working paper. And that's where we were encouraged to write the book. So we've written this book together. It's been fantastic working with him and uh, I'm enjoying every minute of it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, for either of you, what is the general thesis of the demographic reversal? What, What do you mean when you say that? Well, what we mean is that there were some very strong forces causing disinflation, reduction of inflation over the last 30 years. And these are now reversing so that the forces that caused the inflation to come way down and be held down to about 2% or even lower recently are going to reverse now. And that's going to reverse all the factors that we had earlier so that the the Inflation is going to start rising again. Inequality within countries is going to go down. And uh, there's going to be a very severe problem about dealing with debt if and when interest rates start rising. There are two main forces, really, that have leading to uh, the disinflation. The first one has been globalization, whereby first Eastern Europe, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, joined the world's trading system. And then China did too as well. And that has meant that the available working population for anyone who can shift their production from one place to another has more than doubled over the last 30 to 40 years. The blue line on the left was available to uh, producers and manufacturers at the beginning of our period in about 1980. And the yellow line was the additional workers from Eastern Europe and China. And the increase in them would have led to a huge increase in the working age population. And if you can see that chart, you can see that the yellow and the blue line start turning around at about 2010 and now start declining. Let me just ask about that a little bit. So you're saying that um, we would have much more inflation baked into the system if we didn't have globalization and probably technology as well. Those have been disinflationary, right? And again, on the right hand side, you can see the increase in the working age population from year to year, which goes on jumping upwards again to just around 2010. And from now on is going to go rapidly downhill. Um, that's partly because the China is going and much of Europe, the working age population is actually going to shrink in other countries because of the decline in the birth rate. Working age population will at best stagnate. And this was further reinforced by the change in the ratio of dependence. That is, the young who are too too young to work and those who are above the retirement age. Now, the globalization actually reduced world inequality because of the shift of production and 
particularly manufacturing, from the high-wage countries like the U.S. and Europe to the low-wage countries like China and Eastern Europe. You can see the left-hand column. And the ratio of the wages of the American worker to the Chinese worker, which was about 35 as far back as 2000, is only about five. That's a huge change. The Chinese workers have done extremely well. The American workers have done extremely badly. And the same is true to a lesser extent about Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And since there are many more Chinese and Asians, South Koreans, Vietnamese, and so on, than there are Americans and Europeans, it has meant that world inequality has declined, while inequality within each country has actually been increasing quite sharply because the workers, particularly the relatively unskilled, have had a very bad time. In addition to that, there's been the effect of the dependency ratio. The number of young has been declining quite sharply as the birth rate has gone down, while the number of the old has been increasing very rapidly, particularly the oldest old, who are likely to double over the next 15 or so years. And as you get older, the likelihood of having an incapacitating illness like dementia or Parkinson's or just arthritis increases and increases, which means that there is a huge need for additional carers. And the need for Medicare, the need for the need for medical assistance, the need for personal assistance of care for the old is going to mean that the expenditures on this are going to be rising very sharply, with the result that even before the COVID-19 affected the world, uh, the likely increase in public sector deficits and in debt, public sector debt, uh, was growing uh, just rapidly. And of course, the coronavirus has increased this even more so. And, of course, the private sector has now massively increased its debt so that the debt ratios that we now have around the world uh, have been just jumping up very, very sharply. And if interest rates go up, and unfortunately we think they're likely to do so, that is going to put a huge burden both in the public sector uh, and on the private sector. Um, Now, our viewpoint on this is... both rather grimmer, rather more pessimistic than the mainstream, which expects there's going to be interest rates are going to be terribly low, exceptionally low for a very, very long time. Lower for longer, as it's called. We don't agree. The main reason, I think, why the mainstream view this is because of the experience of Japan. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Manoj, uh, who has done much more work on Japan than I have. So Manoj- Japan is a very interesting case study for sure. So these low interest rates, so your basic thesis then is the low interest rates won't last. Yes. And when they go away, it is going to place significant hardship on the economy and widen the uh, divide even more so, right? Absolutely. And the best way of getting out of too high a debt is to grow faster. But here, the decline in the growth of the working age population, in many cases, an absolute cutback in the working age population, is going to mean the growth of anything is going to slow down even further from the relatively slow levels that we've had over the past 10 years or so. Because the rate of growth of GDP, the overall economy, is a function of the number of workers times the increase in their productivity. And productivity has been poor, and the number of workers coming into the system is now going to actually reduce. So we're going to have fewer workers. It would take a productivity miracle for us to be able to grow out of this particular problem. Okay, so we do have a couple of cross currents, though. Number one being obviously automation. You know, still someone needs to operate the robots, right? You know, number two is, and you alluded to it, I've been talking a long time about the exploitation of Africa for, you know, the next move for offshoring being Africa. But Africa is a much different case than China. You know, it's a lot of little countries with conflicting sort of tribalism and You know, language, I mean, Africa is just a whole different thing than than China, isn't it? 
Oh, absolutely. And I'm going to let Manoj talk about China as well. Sure. But we see the decline in the working age population being such and the need for personal care for the old. And if you've ever had anything to do with dementia, you will know that robots just don't cut it. What you need is an emotional support. And the emotional quotient of a robot is absolutely zero. You mean you're talking about the care of elderly now. I, exactly. I was talking about the manufacturing on the assembly yeah. lines and such. Yeah, yeah. I, I get it. Yeah, you're talking about two issues, sir. Sure. So, so the, the way we've thought, we've thought about quite a few things. In fact, some of the objections that you've got um, are things that we have covered in the book, and they fall into a broader set of categories. It, along with Africa, India and parts of South America also have dependency ratios that will not rise and be challenging for quite a while more. The second issue is that perhaps uh, older people can uh, work much later on in their lives. The third one is automation. And in fact, the, the last one that uh, I'll, I'll cover very shortly is, is if all of the things we're saying uh, are likely to happen with aging, why hasn't it happened in Japan? But let me let me walk you through a couple Japan of the things. Japan is aging itself out of existence with its, you know, low, very insanely low birth rates. Same with Western Europe and Russia. No, no birth rate and uh, aging populations in, in all cases. But go ahead. No, it's a, you're absolutely right. It's a very dramatic story. And, you know, you're going to see that in Germany. You're going to see that in North Asia. You're going to see that in Russia, where there are other issues uh, related to the rate at which uh, males are, are not surviving uh, into late ages. But uh, let, let me address some of the questions you've had. First, I think technology. Uh, we want to think that technology has the ability to crush a lot of the employment in repetitive tasks. The reason for that is that, as Charles was saying, and that's why the robotic story about looking after the elderly is important, if robots can't look after the elderly directly, what we need is a reallocation of labor from one part of the economy to the other. So to the extent that many jobs will be crushed in manufacturing, that is actually something we're counting on. If that doesn't happen, our thesis becomes profoundly more powerful. Uh, and let me explain why. What happens is if you look at the demographic projections of the UN population statistics, they're scary enough as it is. But what we don't realize, because we are not seeing those numbers, is as the elderly begin to dominate the population um, and they follow the working age population, many more of them are going to live to a much longer age. And as they live longer and longer, the risk and the incidence of dementia rises almost exponentially. Now, these are diseases that we live with for a very long period of time. They need carers. They need attention, which is what Charles was alluding to. And this is what Charles and I call socially productive work. We do have to look after people who have contributed to our societies, but it's not economically productive in the classic sense. The services being produced are consumed one time by the elderly and the elderly themselves then don't go on to produce anything else. So the, the demographic picture will become even more dire if we start deflecting some of that available labor force to look after the elderly without crushing jobs in manufacturing. So we, we need that story to play itself out. We are depending on that story to play itself out. The second part okay, with Africa... Okay, so first off, when, when you say you sure. look at the UN statistics and they're scary enough, what exactly do you mean by that? Do you mean population growth? Do you mean the age distribution of populations in these different places we talked about? Because we've got uh, coming at us an empty planet eventually, right? But not for a while. So, you know, that's a curve, right? But go ahead. You know. So you're, you're, you're right, actually, both the metrics that you suggested, it's, it's not just the size of the populations, in fact, the labor force, it's also the composition, which is that it's not the young that are forming a large increase in what economists would call the dependency ratio, which is the sum of the young and the old supported by workers. It's the elderly who are not going to rejoin the labor force. But it's also one more thing, which is that the incidence of these headwinds that you describe is happening in all the economies that today make up the bulk of the contribution to global growth. Every theater in the global economy that is a large mover and shaker is going to see a demographic decline, which will be a significant headwind. And the likes of India and Africa and uh, Southern American states have the ability to grow fast. But like you said, they don't have the uh, administrative infrastructure. We don't think they have the ability to build human capital quickly. And together, that means 
They can't really export labor because that's politically just impossible at the moment. They can import capital to an extent that they will do well, but they can't import it and transform it into an output at the rate that will offset the demographics that are available in the rest of the world. That's just not going to happen, we think. Okay, so uh, tell us why the dependency ratio is so important. And you well, know, maybe ferret that out a little bit more for people, if you would. Well, let me let me take that on. First of all, uh, two reasons why a increase in the ratio of workers uh, is disinflationary. The first one is that you don't hire a worker unless they produce more than you pay them, for obviously. And what's more, the workers have got to save for their own retirement. So the higher the ratio of workers to dependents the more disinflationary the system is. While dependents, the young and the old, consume, but they don't produce. And therefore, by definition, they're more inflationary. Moreover, when the number of young started to decline and we got all the increase in consumer durables, there was an enormous increase in the participation rate of women. And that meant that there was a shift out of home production, which did not count towards GDP, to into women working in the labor force, which did count towards GDP. So in a sense, the rate of growth of output was considerably over, uh, over-exaggerated during the years when the dependency ratio was improving. Okay, let me, that's, that's really interesting. So what you're saying is that the domestic work at the home is not counted in GDP, Correct. which we, we all know that. And so when women shifted into the workforce, the GDP numbers went up, as yep. as you would think. There's more production. There's more people in the workforce. But what? What? But what does that mean? So, so in other words, that wasn't. Well, it was an increase, but it wasn't. I mean, I I, I don't know. You know, then there then there became legions of housekeepers. So, well, yeah. I mean, the thing is that when somebody buys a clothes washer, that adds to GDP. When they wash clothes at home by themselves, it does not add to GDP. So we shift from washing everything by hand at home, which used to be the way things were done, to having a clothes washer and going out to work in the labor force and producing more, led to a sharp rise in the rate of growth of output overall. But the number of clothes that actually got washed didn't change very much. So what does that mean? What, where, where do we go with that? Does well, that just what mean that we not we well, won't see that kind of increase in the future because the women are already in the workforce now. Yeah, exactly. So that benefit to growth is, is being done. And now we've got the opposite effect with the rate of growth of the number of retired increasing very sharply. So that the dependency ratios are now going to worsen because the number of people who are old and retired is going to increase as a considerable proportion of the total population. And they need a great deal of care and looking after. As Manoj said, dementia increases exponentially. Once you get over 85, the likelihood of needing a considerable amount of support and care, and that has to be done by people, it can't be done by robots, increases to something like about 70% of the, of those of that age group. When you get to about over 90, it increases to almost 100%. 100 Fair enough. Centenarians can't look after themselves. Fair enough. However, you are making one assumption, which may be valid for a long time, but probably not forever, is that, you know, there won't be treatments, cures, advanced, you know, I mean, of course, that's a possibility, but a slow process. Indeed, and you certainly can't rely on it. I to rely on the ability. I the medicine has done wonderful things in dealing uh, with cardiovascular, with dealing with cancer, uh, with dealing with cataracts and things like that. Everything under the neck they've dealt with magnificently. But the success so far in dealing with problems related to the working of the brain has actually been horribly disappointing. 90 or so drugs that have been tried, only about two or three have had any beneficial effect whatsoever. And even that has been slight. Jason, let's look at it this way. I mean, you know, first, we would love to be wrong. 
it, it really would give us immense pleasure to know that uh, there has been a way out of here. And a few, a small laundry list of things that could prove us wrong are the following. If we get a cure, pretty much the way we're looking for a cure for COVID, if we can get a cure for dementia and old age related diseases, or as the WHO has been pointing out, a lot of it can be prevented. People could work till later on in their life. Second is if a lot of work could be transformed from physical work to mental work. Being old helps you do that, but physical work is still hard when you're aging. Second is if AI turns out to be an absolutely fantastic game changer for productivity, not just for the few jobs that we can see an immediate impact in, but just all around everywhere, including caring. Um, and the last bit really is if policymakers don't have to wait for a crisis to show up at their doorsteps and take action now uh, to really address some of the issues we've raised in this book, but we don't see any of that happening at the moment. Yeah, yeah that's very much wishful thinking on the part of government. Yeah, <laughs> or it really is. Government. Okay, so go on. You know, I'm looking at the table of contents. You cover a lot of things in this book. Let's switch gears and, and you know, grab it another area that you want to cover. I just want to make sure we get all this out. Well, one of the one of the key things that uh, we get asked, and and you alluded to this uh, yourself, right, which is that the tip of the spear or the blueprint for an aging society uh, has already been seen. Many argue in Japan. So Japan's been aging for a very long period of time. Like you were saying, the concerns are that they don't really have much immigration inward, so their population growth is really dwindling into nothing. And if all of that is true, why haven't we seen our thesis playing out there? Why have we seen in many cases the opposite. And Charles and I, we've, we've looked at this topic and our argument is that the way Japan has been treated has been symptomatic of a lot of the problems that we see in the analysis of the global economy. It has been And when treated, you say, why don't you see your thesis playing out? You mean inflation, right? Correct. Okay. Inflation. Because, because Japan has huge debt levels, about 230% of GDP, and it has an aging population, but it also has, you know, it's really like the lost three decades, you know, I mean, not, not even two decades anymore. So why don't you see it playing out there? Yeah, actually, actually, it's interesting you say that. And let's use that as a starting point, right? I mean, the, the the first point you'd look at is they really did have a lost decade. There's no doubt. After the asset price bubble burst, they really had a lost decade. But since then, they've had 1% GDP growth, which doesn't look fantastic at all. But when you consider that the population and the working age population has been falling and the workforce has been falling by 1%, the difference between the two, which is productivity, is 2% a year. Now, if you offer 2% a year productivity growth to the advanced economies, they'd uh, bite your hand off today. So they've right. done very well on that front. The second thing to keep in mind is Japan is not an autarkic society. There was no way that Japan was blocking off either the disinflationary forces or the impact of this massive labor supply shock at its borders. So Japan going into inflation while China was deflating the rest of the world is in incomprehensible. When we look at Japan and we look at it as a closed society and we say, well, this is what happened in Japan. They went into deflation because of its demography. What we're effectively doing is we are saying that Japanese corporates and, and uh, the policymakers there disregarded the rest of the world. And they absolutely did not. One of our key contributions to that debate is finding new data and new evidence from Japan's own ministries that shows very clearly that Japan's corporate sector looked at the domestic economy and said, that's not where I want to invest. Where I do want to invest is in China, North Asia, Brazil, Poland. And indeed, if you look at what's been happening there, the ratio of overseas to domestic production, not only of manufacturing, but of employment, services, profit, everything has been increasing at a very steady pace for the last 30 years. So Japan behaved in a profit maximizing manner outside. Within its economies, its labor force was treated, as we all know, very differently from the rest of the world. You could not really fire those with uh, employment for life contracts. So Japan moved them from manufacturing to services where you could better protect uh, their hours and they moved to part time workers. So I think Japan, on our point of view, has been misdiagnosed and using that as a a roadmap for what is yet to come is an extremely misleading story which is why we have market prices where they are right now, and they're about to be proven wrong. And when you say market prices, are you referring to the stock market? 
Uh, partly to a large, to to a large extent, I mean interest rates. So if you look at okay. where interest rates are, and this is the point you made earlier, which is that you know their Japan's debt has skyrocketed, and what has allowed them to remain that high, which is a point Charles has made many times, uh, is that the cost of servicing that debt has fallen to incredibly low levels. And so what we've seen for the future is everyone's expecting interest rates over the next 10, 20, 30 years are going to remain very low, which means there is no pressure on stock markets and the impact on currencies is unknown. If we are right, we're going to start with those interest rates being at the wrong level and all of the subsequent changes that will reverberate through the risky asset spectrum will then be a function of that initial change. And we've been living in a remarkably favorable time for capital. And with the result that what has happened is been debt ratios everywhere have gone up very, very sharply. But interest rates have fallen just as sharply. So debt service ratios have remained flat or even declined. So the burden of the debt has not been increasing. But interest rates can't go down anymore and are very likely to rise somewhat. Uh, in the aftermath of the, the pandemic and with the reduction in the working population that we see coming and with the greater protectionism, the end of globalization, the return of business to each country. I, one of the features of the COVID pa- pandemic was that every country became even more national. They They all insisted on keeping their own drugs and personal protective equipment. The COVID pandemic has moved globalization even further backwards. The COVID pandemic has uh, really promoted the Trump agenda. Um, Candidate Trump back in 2015 and 16, you know, this is all the stuff that he was uh, talking about. And, you know, he's getting it through COVID, if not his own uh, efforts obviously. But, you know, I think there's some sense to that. I mean, countries should make their own PPE and some of their own things and their own vaccines. And, you know, so some of that should be uh, done onshore. Uh, you know, this is just my personal opinion. We can't be dependent. You know, every country can't be totally dependent for emergency style needs on other trading partners that need them themselves. Right. And we'll- yeah, but you, you, you have to be aware of the implications of that, because, In the past with globalization, any employer could turn around to the workers and say, if you insist on having a higher wage, so be it, but we will move the production offshore and you you will no longer have a job. That is no longer going to be the case. The effect of globalization and the massive upward supply shock in the labor force and the shift of labor out of manufacturing, where they were relatively well concentrated and, and unionized, Uh, to the service economy, to the gig gig economy, has absolutely trashed the bargaining power of labor. Oh, I know. And the bargaining power of labor is going to come back. I think if you, uh, just to put Charles's point in a slightly different way, connecting to the initial comment you had is, is where do we... So where do we stop that story? If it is for national and public interest that you produce PP at home and disregard profit considerations, I would have no objection to that. But then you could take that story on to uh, a few other industries where sure you could you make can. similar it, arguments. It could be endless. And, yeah, you could right. rationalize and that's, I, I'm just exactly. saying to some that's extent, where that you know, up. it just seems logical that some of this, you know, you can't be just completely dependent. Of course. But, but look, that's a neither here nor there. That's just my opinion, okay? I, I could be wrong. <laughs> but, you know, what you, you've got a diagram in the book where you talk about stagflation, and I've predicted that that is the era in which we are moving into. I don't know if it'll be the 70s style stagflation, but I think we are going to see a higher inflation, and I think we are going to see a uh, a real shift in employment and, and so forth. You, you've alluded to it in kind of different ways. And I'm just wondering, do you think that's what we're coming into, stagflation? And for the inflation component of that, you say inflation is coming, and I agree with you, by the way. How much? Like, can you put a number on that? And are you talking about U.S. when you say that or global or both? I think we'll be lucky if we can hold inflation to a rate of about four or five percent per annum. As an official number, like a CPI number, which most people believe that's understated, uh, you know. (laughs) Well, it is at the moment because of the shift in uh, the consumer basket, what people buy. 
the current CPI figures for inflation are are almost meaningless and certainly underestimate the true rate of inflation at the moment, though not by an enormous amount. Let me get an opinion from you on that. Uh, Do you think the true rate of inflation is is 50% higher than the CPI? Is it double the CPI? It depends on the – because if you have a CPI of zero – Well, well, say the CPI is at their target rate of 2% when it is, okay? Well, the CPI Uh, is not at 2%. uh, I I understand. But but just say it's 2, then is it really 3 or is it really 4? No, it's probably around 2. Okay. Um, and that's that. That's more in uh, in Europe. I'm not. A, I wouldn't like to be dogmatic about what the U.S. situation yeah. was. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So, but but stagflation is that what we're coming into? The inflation, yes. The question of stag. I mean, we're in some ways we're quite optimistic in that we do think that productivity per worker is going to improve because in order to retain, remain competitive. Manufacturers who are able to maintain an enormous profit margin by shifting everything to low wage countries abroad will now have to invest in order to make the workers where unit wage costs are likely to rise more productive in order to, to, to cut, cut down on labor costs. So we think that productivity per worker will rise as it did in Japan. We think that investment will, corporate investment will go back up and that productivity will recover. But we'll do very well if we do as well as Japan. And you talked about three lost decades. We think that given the demographic difficulties that Japan faced during the last two decades, they've actually done very well. And we will all, and that includes the US and the UK, be doing very well if we can increase our productivity per worker to the level that Japan has managed to do. Yeah. Look, yeah. Look. Well, J- Japan is impressive intellectually and technologically and in terms of ambition. I mean, the workers are extremely ambitious. They work very hard, very many hours in Japan. So so fair enough. I was sort of including the demographic problem into the mix. And China, by the way, has a demographic problem coming up in a decade or so as well. So, you know, the one child policy is uh, about to really rear its head. Go ahead, Manoj. But I, I really want to make sure and I know we've been going long. I want to make sure because I'd be totally remiss if I did not ask you a little bit more about Goodhart's Law. So I do want to get to that before you go. But uh, Manoj, you were going to say say something. Yeah, I I was going to say, I mean, if you think about it from an uh, econ 101 point of view, right? I mean, it's been a very long time since uh, since I taught that class. Uh, But if you think about it from that point of view, it's it's interesting to contrast it against something like the 70s stagflation, right? There, what you would get is a negative supply shock that would create a negative output gap. So you'd have uh, unemployment at high levels and you would get the inflationary impact. What we are arguing is different over here is that what you're getting with a declining labor force is that potential growth itself is going to come down. And real factors in our case, as we have argued, are the ones that are going to lead a nominal variable like inflation higher. So if you mean by stagflation that you're going to get lower growth than we've had in the past, that is absolutely right because inflation will be higher and growth will be lower. But it's not the kind that you get massive amounts of unemployment. You get reallocation of labor from one sector to the other. But overall, we think with productivity and employment, it will actually benefit workers not only from a social but from an economic point of view. Good. So the news is not all bad then, right? It's uh, good in some ways, for sure, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. You want to wrap it up with Goodhart's Law? (laughs) Okay. It's when the government, when the government or anybody in a position of power makes a relationship into a target, then the previous relationship will tend to break down. Let me give you an example, not from economics, uh, but shall we say from education. Let's say that there is a pretty good relationship between somebody's score in mathematics and their overall ability to deal with uh, sort of, um, success in later life. So the, the government then targets a mathematical exam in order to try and raise standards. So you know, schools get graded on the result for the, uh, this particular maths exam. 
The result of that is that every school then effectively focuses on getting their students to pass that particular maths exam without necessarily having a grounding in a whole series of other kinds of important educational training or necessarily knowing much about maths outside the specific areas in which they're going to be tested in the exam. As a result, what you would find is the prior relationship between mathematics ability as tested by this exam and subsequent success in life would collapse. Making something into a target changes the way everybody behaves. Uh, It changes the way the people who are subject to the target behave, and it even changes the way that the authorities themselves behave. Um, Again, to take an example, governments don't like it if the targets they have set are not met. So very frequently, they will actually change the way that things are scored in order to ensure that a sufficient proportion of the of the population on at doing this uh, actually right. achieves the target itself. Yeah, fast, so, fascinating. That that's that's really excellent. You know, it almost makes me call to mind two. I, I'm sure you'll say unrelated things because I think they are unrelated. But you know, they're kind of in the. I want to say like the double slit experiment and Hawthorne's law or the Hawthorne experiment, I guess I should say. I don't know if that became like a law, if you will. But, you know, that you whenever you you make something a thing, then the focus changes and it skews it. It it, it abuses it. Right. That indicator. Right. Yeah. That's very interesting. Very interesting. You remember the Westinghouse experiment? No, I don't know that one. Tell me. It was a lovely one. Westinghouse experiment was was a factory, and they tried to see what made the workers more productive. Uh And they changed the... Oh, that was the lighting, right? Yeah, and then they changed the period of the tea break, and they changed the period of the the break to go to the john, and so on and so on. Every time they changed something, Mm -hmm. productivity went up. And then they thought, I wonder what's happening. And they started... changing it the other way. Productivity still went up. Mm-hmm, and what right. they discovered was that what made productivity go up was that actually the people felt that others were interested in them. Right. And because they were interested in them, they, they worked actually harder. And, and because they were being observed, mm-hmm. that changed their behavior. Yeah. So the very fact of, of undertaking changes and setting targets changes behavior and therefore changes the relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good stuff. Do you have a website you want to give out? Or I mean, the book is available, of course, in all the usual places. And it looks great, by the way, you've got so many charts and graphs in here. I I just I love that. Did you have a a website you'd like to share or anything? We don't have a website. I think we're happy with just the book being uh, pushed out there. Okay, good. Glad you liked it. And the book is called The Great Demographic Reversal, Aging yeah. Societies, Waning Inequality, and an Inflation Revival. Charles Goodhart and Manoj Pradhan. So thank you so much for joining us today. Very interesting discussion. Thank you, too. Pleasure. Appreciate Thanks it. for having us. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go Go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.